Welcome to Good Service. We are your hosts, Ben Chung. And Kevin Zha. Each week, we'll be breaking bread and having real, raw, and vulnerable talks about life, faith, and everything in between, and always over a fire meal. Thanks for joining our table today. Let's eat. Folks, welcome or welcome back to Good Service. We are your host, Ben. Kevin. And we have two very special guests today in the pod. Today we have Benny and Janice Yu from El Pozo de Vida. All right. Ooh, perfect. Okay. Welcome. Pronunciation there, bro. I tried. I tried. <laughs> man, I tried. So um, welcome. First of all, welcome to the pod. Thank you guys for stopping in. We're really excited to have you guys here, especially, well, tonight we're doing something special. Mm-hmm. You guys are going to be sharing with uh, our group. So we have Break Bread, our Bible study. And so... Some folks are going to be coming in and um, yeah, you guys are going to be sharing with what you guys do. But for the sake of the podcast, Mm -hmm. can you guys give us a little bit of the background? What you guys doing? What is El Pozo? What is the mission? Why are you guys doing what you're doing and all that good stuff? Go ahead. We always have have to do this. Yeah. We, we've been doing this for many years and it's still the same every single time. Yeah. Well, we went down to Mexico City uh, to do a church plant. So like missionaries as missionaries 16 years ago. Mm. And we wanted to from the get go reach like the unreached or people who even feel rejected by church or they feel hurt by the church uh, and not feel comfortable at an institutionalized church. So the whole concept was like church without walls. Um, and we were doing stuff with the creatives, like mm. the break dancers, um, uh, b boys, and like and jazz, you know, mm. artists. Just whomever we found, we had one medieval performer that was blowing fire from their <laughs> mouth, and wow. so we used to do like evangelistic, um, you know, uh, gatherings. Like what year was this? One this was two thousand seven. Yeah, got it. Okay. Yeah. So from the get-go, it was always seeking the difficult or like seeking the people who were unseen or the most broken. Mm. And we knew that from the get-go that our platform was going to be out of our pain because no matter what, uh, you know, different socioeconomic, uh, ethnicity you are, like everybody have gone through some pain. So we felt like that's our common platform that we can connect with people. Yeah, so we got this curveball thrown towards us. Like, I don't know if you ever had a curveball thrown to you by God, you know? <laughs> yeah, all some, the time. All the time, something <laughs> oh, yes. like that, right? Oh, yes. Um, curveball but, from our perspective, yeah, not yeah, from his. Yeah, not from his. Mm, yeah, that's yeah, another yeah, thing. Yeah, that's really good, important. Man. We'll get into that. We'll get into that. Mm. But uh, I, I think um, for us, that curveball was learning about the issue of human trafficking. Mm. And at that point in time, you know, they were saying that there were 27 million modern day slaves. Wow. And uh, wow. now the statistics are anywhere from 38 to 50 million. Uh, it's a it's a worldwide issue, right? And um, sex trafficking, but also labor trafficking, migrant trafficking, all these things are part of the human trafficking mm-hmm. pro- uh, problem worldwide. But what really broke my heart was that um, they were estimating eight to 11 million kids were in sex trafficking. Mm-hmm. Wow! And wow. I was like that broke me because when I was a kid, when I was eight and nine years old, I was sexually abused and raped by my neighbor. He was my cello teacher. And so, you know, I I had gone through my own healing process, you know, through college, I mean, hit depression, mm-hmm. suicide attempts, all that type of stuff, right? But then I got pulled out of it. And then, um, you know, as we were getting married and thinking about our kids, you know, and my kids in the future, I was like, I'm gonna do everything I could to protect my kids. Mm-hmm. Fast forward, we're up in Mexico, two kids were there doing the, church plant and I'm like learning about this issue and I'm like god how do we live in a world where there's 8 to 11 million kids being raped every single night Hmm. that's not I can't I can't deal with that right and he said to me Benny you didn't go through that pain just to protect your kids you went through that pain so it can become a platform to show my power to the world Mm, and what that means is that I have to like share my pain expose my pain talk about the stuff that I had gone through as a kid, Mm -hmm. what, you know, how it transformed me and how it's actually becoming like a strength and something that we can use as a platform to uh, do the anti-trafficking work. And so then we started the anti-trafficking work by first opening up our safe house. Mm -hmm. And then I was a psych major and then I did my master's in education. So it was all about the individualized um, educational plan. So, uh, 
thinking about that kind of concept, we wanted our model to be holistic from the get-go. Uh, we know that you know any kind of pain or trauma affects us holistically. Our mind, our heart, you know, our physical body, our spirit. So if you don't treat the person holistically, then you're only doing subpar quality work. Mm. So we designed a holistic model for our girls. And then from there, we're like, dude, we need to address this issue holistically as, as well. So we started with a safe house and then we opened up a community center in the red light district. And then it continued to grow uh, in our effort to address the issue of human trafficking holistically and it grew to nine different projects and two um, campaigns. Um, and every year we're, we're seeming to occur like a, another campaign because at the end, we, if we don't shift the mindset of our culture, um, people are still dying in their minds, you know? Uh, so that's why campaigns are important to bring awareness and so forth, so addressing some of the root issues of you know, why we even have human trafficking. What year was the safe house? So 2007, you guys get to Mexico yeah. City and then... By, by 2000, uh, late 2008, early 2009. 2009, we were already doing the groundwork. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it took about a year to establish a legal nonprofit yeah. status. So you guys went to Mexico City thinking, hey, we're just going to go do mission work. <laughs> This wasn't even on the table. No, it was on the table. I didn't even know what human trafficking was. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, to be honest with you, I don't really know too much about yeah. it. So even you guys coming here today, yeah. I'm like, it's selfishly raising awareness. Like, oh, yeah. I get to learn about what this is. Totally. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you can explain to me like a dummy. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, I don't yeah. even know what a safe house is. Like, what's a safe house? Yeah, I think for me, it's like, God, what? There's modern day slaves? I thought mm. like slavery is abolished, right. you yeah. know? So I think for me, that's what kind of like grabbed my heart. Like there are children that needs to be set free. There are hmm. people that are bound and they need to be set free. W was there like a specific incident that this came? Like how, how did, like how does one like, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you're, you're yeah. in Mexico right. City, yeah. so like doing our, mission work and all of a sudden some, something must have happened. Like, yeah, so yeah, yeah. our yeah. friend, uh, so we were previously going to Mexico. We, we went to, we were living in Thailand with, um, you know, our, our church went, planted um, a church in Bangkok and a bunch of us went right and then we were just it was our training ground and uh, from there we kind of like dispersed throughout the, the the world and so my very close friend Dave Brubaker went to uh, London and I was in Mexico City and then Brubaker calls me up one day and says hey I have a friend she's going to be going to uh, you know from she's coming from London to to Mexico City to work with this women's coalition and she didn't have a place to stay. So, you know, she crashed at our place and she started talking to us about the issue of human trafficking, right? Mm, she was there doing some anti-trafficking stuff. Yeah, she was showing us pictures of missing children yeah. and how most of them um, ends up being uh, victims of human trafficking. Yeah, so j just to answer your question, Ben, I mean, like, so you know, just like Jens was saying, right? So we thought slavery is abolished, right? There's emancipation proclamation, no more slavery, but the, the term modern day slavery is like, you see uh, there is a slavery and exploitation that happens and many times it doesn't seem like the normal type of slavery like i own you and you're my property but i basically essentially own that person whether it be through debt whether it be through mm -hmm. violence whether it be mm -hmm. through some type of manipulation or exploitation yeah control i'm controlling that person where that person has no will of their own and they can't make the decisions mm -hmm. on their own or you dehumanize them to the point where they don't think they can make their own decisions right uh, so they live in fear and they they live in threat right and so uh in the context of right sexual exploitation or sexual manipulation or slavery right mm -hmm. where they're no longer like you know they're not making the choice so a lot of people they you know say oh it, you know it was it's prostitution not all, all cases are but it's becoming because it's such a quote unquote lucrative many people are using that business and manipulating people and so like if you mm -hmm. uh, like just i know this is a tangent but like um there, there are these two models of of thought when it comes to like the the swiss model or the dutch i mean sorry the, the Swedish model or Scandinavian model and uh, the Dutch model. So basically the Dutch model is like, okay, let's just legalize prostitution and then regulate it, right? Kind of like in Amsterdam, everybody goes and they see the, the red light district kind of, or Las Vegas, right? 
And so <clears throat> the, the Scandinavian model is more like, okay, let's penalize the purchasing of sex, right? And make it really hefty, like make it like, you know, a five, $15,000 fine if you buy solicit sex, right? So uh, within 18 months, like 86% of, mm -hmm. of prostitution just dropped in, in Sweden, right? But in Amsterdam, it continued. And so in, in Europe, they were like, okay, which one do we take on? Germany took on the Dutch model. And after 10 years, um, and it's been more than 10 years, but at, at the 10 year mark, more or less, there were um, on average, a mil sex was being sold a million times per day in Germany, right? And then like you go to the brothels in Germany and then you, they give you a menu Literally, they give you a menu and then it's like women from all over the world. So then you have to ask, ask yourself, wait, who's bringing these women from the Philippines or from Thailand or from mm -hmm. from Africa? Wh where, where are they coming from? How are they getting here? What's what's happening? Right. Um, because it's not just it's not just the, you know, local women. So these are all things that it becomes a more of an international thing, the globalization uh, of the economy. It's like, this is a real, like they say, um, human trafficking makes more money than like Starbucks and Google and Coca-Cola combined. That's globally. insane. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's crazy. Because once, you sell, once I sell oh. you a Coke, I don't have the Coke anymore. Well, if I sell the person, I can sell that person over and over and over and over again. Mm. And so that's the way it happens in, the, uh, in sexual exploitation and labor trafficking where their people mm. are literally working as and it's they're not even getting paid to work um and then and there's usually very mm. hard labor you know um in mines and and brick making mm. in india and so forth i mean I, I know i'm going off on a tangent but there's that's the reality of the world today that we're living in and that's just a little bit of of an introduction of what yeah. human trafficking looks like globally. I mean, for for me, during that time, as we were learning more about it, um, God started to talk to us about Isaiah 58. And in Isaiah 58, it's addressing like what true fasting is, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and it's not about like putting on sackcloth and being somber and religious and pious, but true fasting is setting the oppressed free. It's true fasting is um, helping those who are in need. So it's about justice work. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Well, in righteousness, part of the righteousness is his justice. So in Spanish, it actually translates to seek ye first kingdom of God and his justice. And a lot of us, like, I think we settle in just seek ye first the kingdom of God. They love the whole concept of kingdom, um, but uh, they don't realize that in God's heart, he sees injustice and he's like, we're like, why are you letting this happen, God? Where are you? And, you know, are you dead? Do you not care? Do you not love us? You know, in God's mind, it's like, where are my people? Mm -hmm. Where are my hands and feet? You know, why aren't you doing something about it? So it was his complaint to the Israelites that they were focusing more on the religious acts of fasting and worship and all of that, but not really engaging in setting the oppressed free. So he kept talking to, we couldn't avoid that verse. We, we kept hearing it over and over, over and over. And finally, like we had to say yes. Knowing that there's risk involved, knowing that we may even die doing this work. And pretty much like one evening we had a conversation and he asked me, what if I die doing this? Is that okay? I'm like, well, this is what we signed up for. So wow. yeah, I'll see you in heaven, you know? That's wild. So yeah. I think it, it does require a level of boldness. Mm. But to go back to answering your question about what is a safe house? So government does a sting operation. And so each girl that are at our safe house, we've served over 170 girls, um, minors, and, and there is a legal process behind that. So they're either witnesses or they're actually testifying, you know, they're the direct testifier against the you know, uh, the one who persecuted or the abuser or the trafficker. Um, and majority, sadly, majority of our girls have been sold by their own mother. So Jeez. it's like a family business that's been around for generations. So there is a sense of like dehumanization that happens because you grew up in that environment where nobody's affirming your true value and worth. So it's easier to victimize them then. 
So anyways, the government does a sting operation and then there's a legal process and they do an interview process and see that this that they de determine first that this is a human trafficking case and then they send it to channel like to the authorized uh, safe homes. There's only 12 in all of Mexico, which only eight of them are only uh, designed to receive only the human trafficking victims. The other houses are mixed population. So we're considered a specialized home home, which is not just their victims of human trafficking, which that in itself tells you there's like 90 different trauma issues and abuse issues that they need to heal from, but they also have neurodiversity. So they either have some ADHD or learning disability, mental retardations, and also medical issues, which is like diabetes um, is a common one. So uh, there's an immense amount of other mental situations. So we are a specialized house that can receive these difficult population. So that's what safe houses, they're, they're there 24 seven. We feed them, we, they, mm -hmm. yeah, they're clothed. They do, we have an in-house school, so they get educated. Most of them at 16 years old, they don't know how to read and write, but by grace of God, with their trauma brain, they're like advancing and learning. Wow. So we have right now two who have transitioned to another house because they're older and they're going to college. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of them have become project leaders. Um, yeah, it's just, we've seen so much miracles. You know. So I think wow. one key is like, um, like Janice was mentioning earlier about like uh, our areas of prevention, intervention, restoration. So basically it's like our approach being holistic is in the sense of, okay, we need to cover all the bases. It needs to be 360, a 360 degree approach. A whole, like we're looking at the whole issue from start to end. So like our prevention programs and our awareness programs, like that's key to help address the issue before it even starts. So uh, I always use this example to help people kind of visualize. Yeah, visualize what that looks like. So imagine you're walking in the forest. I don't know how often you guys go hiking in the forest, but you imagine you're walking in the forest and you're walking next to a river you're all by yourself. And all of a sudden you hear this baby crying, right? You turn around and you see this baby floating down the river in a basket. What are you going to do? You, Try to save the baby. You're going to save, save the baby, baby right? Yeah. You save the baby. So you jump in the water and you save the baby. And then you hear another baby crying. So you're going to see another baby floating on the river in a basket. Mm -hmm. You're going to jump and save that baby and over and over again, right? Sure. Another baby, another baby, another baby, another baby. So then you ask yourself a series of questions, right? What is, who's like, what are those questions that you're asking? Right? Where are these babies coming <laughs> Where from? Where are they coming yeah. from, right? Who's, who's doing, doing that? Doing this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And who's right. going to help me? Where are they going? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And then now I have like 500 babies here. Where who's going to take these care of them? Who's going to take right. care of these 500 right. babies? Right. Right. Right, so this like model kind of really, uh, or like this visualization, right? It's kind of like a way to see the problem uh, at different stages, and then uh, it can apply to any social ill, yeah. right? It could, it's, this is we're address we're using it and applying it to human trafficking, but it could be like homelessness, I don't know, home, or, you know, yeah. homelessness. It could be drug abuse. It could be whatever it might be, mm -hmm. right? So you want to stop the problem before it starts. So you need to walk upstream and figure out what's going on over there and help uh, stop it, mm -hmm. right? What can you do, everything that you need to do to stop it? You know, that could be education awareness programs, like PSAs, like public service announcements, and or like, you know, really training and working also with the, the demand side, right? Mm -hmm. So if no one wants to buy, you know, I don't know, this this microphone, no one's gonna sell that micro this microphone, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there's a demand for it, how do you address that demand? Help it. Un why do they want it? Why right? do they want it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and why is like what's really disturbing for me is I'm driving around here in like Southern California. It's like there's so many mas massage. Nobody needs massage that much. Like I don't like <laughs> it's and it, they're notoriously known, right? These massage parlors are notoriously known to be places where there's right. Uh, you know, it's sex trafficking. These girls are coming from on from all over containers yeah. and stuff. And then uh, what also, like, I think about when you think about intervention, now you have to jump in the water, right? As as the babies are going down the river, you have to jump in the water. At say, the place of risk. At the place of risk. So you have to put yourself at risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there might be current, there might be rocks, but then you can also be creative, right? So what are those creative things? Like you could build a dam, you could, you know, I don't know, find some Special type of way net. to a, a <laughs> hook or a net, right? Mm -hmm. There's some ways that you can do to help mitigate the issue 
and intervene in creative ways. Like what we do is we have that community center in the red light district where we reach the girls, but we also do things like block parties. We throw block parties in, in the, the red light district. Yeah, on the street. It's yeah. like a flash mob block party. That's yeah, yeah. the idea that we have. Mm, yeah, so we mm. take the eight, like 60, 80 volunteers. We go out, we, we put like streamers, we get mariachi, you know, music. Tacos. <laughs> Tacos, mm. and we do like, you manicure, know, manicures, hand, massage. hand massages. And then we also work with the men, depending upon the, the context, but we work with the men and then uh, also work with the, the pimps and the traffickers. Like we build relationship. Everything's relationship driven. We're not trying to like, oh, this is bad. We're no, no judgment. We're like there to build relationships because mm -hmm. they invite us. You know, they're happy when they see us. They're not like, oh, here comes those people. They want to like come try, and judge us. Yeah, yeah, judge us or make me change my life or anything like that. Mm -hmm. We're meeting them right where they're at. Um, and if they make the choice, we have resources available right. for them. Mm -hmm. But that's, I think that's the most important thing because they don't feel like we're coming mm -hmm. with like a, a package or like that's, that's the thing. We don't say that we empower people because there's only one person who gives power, right? Mm -hmm. I can't come and say, I have power to give because if that, that means that I'm, I'm just being basically another colonist or imperialist, right? That I can take it away. I then. can take, I can give power and take power away. Mm -hmm. That's not what we were about. We're about just pointing mm -hmm. people to the one that does have power. Um, and then the restoration is like all the part is you get all the 500 babies helping them, you know, getting them. I have like so many questions. <laughs> I know. I'm just, I mean, I'm like, the more, the more you guys are telling me, I'm just like, I have like a million questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm in like, silence because I'm just like learning, man. Yeah, I feel like I'm we haven't like been this silent. This, and I'm like, see, <laughs> just really quick because I know the food yeah, is speaking like, of digesting. It, the food yeah. is probably cold. That's okay. It's okay. But we gotta we wanted get to you guys it. to jump into, I know this topic is like, it's heavy, but it's also so important. So I want to yeah. give space for it. We also want to make sure you guys eat while yes. you guys are yes. enjoying the food. Um, I didn't know where, when it was a good time. I know. To it was, it, it, it's, it's so serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was it's like, so serious. I, I was so serious. I was like, I had to. Um, and we don't want to make light of anything either. It's just um, like just listening to it. Mm -hmm. There's just so much. There's a lot happening. But I also want to like kind of go back a little bit too oh, yeah, yeah. as we're could we just basically like took a fire hose and just oh, stuck oh, it trying yeah, to stick it down yeah. your mouth. And no, I love it though. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, yeah. someone that. Um, I also suffer. I mean, we both probably do from a lot of attention disorder. Yeah, yeah. so 100%. like this is great. You guys yeah, yeah. were just like I'm firing actually surprised away. because he has attention deficit, so he's always like, "What are we doing?" <laughs> he just but like I could tell he probably <laughs> yeah. You know why? Because that, he that's changes not his topics normal. a lot. Uh -huh. That's not his normal though. But I like. I love you guys were like, <laughs> like yeah. Anyway, so yeah. it was really yeah. easy well, for well, me. Let's to get into the food. What are we? What are we having today? I was wondering too. I was like, we're having moon bowls today. Moon bowls. Moon bowls. As we show this off here, we all have different Ooh, yes, bowls in front yes, of us. Yes, uh, we have I mean, orange chicken. We have cauliflower wings mm -hmm. or sauced stuff. And we have... Um, I feel like I have a chicken bowl. I think you just have a regular chicken bowl. I got a chicken bowl. We also have egg. a beef bowl for the other members here. And uh, we just got a bunch of bowls from Moon Bowls. So Moon shout Bowls, thank Moon you guys. Bowls. Uh, yes. Shout out for this very deep and very important conversation yes. <laughs> that you guys get to be a part of today. So <laughs> as you guys are enjoying your food, um, I'm going to I'm gonna take a crack at the first question. And uh -huh. I'm going to give Ben a chance here too, because like we're just learning money. so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think for me... Because of where you guys are at today, we definitely want to get back to where you guys are at today too. I want to take a step back real quick um, mm -hmm. and learn a little bit more about you guys, as ben, mm -hmm. uh, Benny and Janice, is that, I mean, it's not like you guys woke up one day and said, <laughs> hey, we're going to leave the country wherever, I don't know where you guys are from even, like mm -hmm. I don't even know where you're original, you know, born, wherever you guys were born, I don't even know where you guys were born. So. It, you guys don't wake up one day and go, hey, I'm going to go live in another country, uh, <laughs> talk about Jesus in a very different way and go do that. That's what missionaries are. And more context on, I know we use some Christian language there, which was we use uh, words like coalition. We use words like, um, I think we were talking about a couple of things around missions, but mm -hmm. just to explain even that, it's like mm -hmm. people that choose to learn how to teach the you know the bible in mm -hmm. the christian context and then going out to another country mm -hmm. and teaching that mm -hmm. is t is the original intent mm -hmm. but how did that even get to that point like how did you go you Why know what we, i love jesus so yeah. much i'm just gonna uproot my whole life and then now you're in this amazing whirlwind of jesus and he's taking you to all these beautiful places i'll answer first 
Yes. So we can give Benny. Ooh, that bite was good, by the way. Hose fire. <laughs> Hose Shout fire. The bite was good. Yeah. Bite was good. Nice. The bowls it. are good. Moon yeah. bowls. Yeah. Shout yes. out moon bowls. Well, uh, for me, um, so I, I started to believe in God when I was eight, uh, 13. And I actually wow. am from like an atheist family. So my mm. dad, um, he was actually baptized when he was in his 20s in Texas. He was like an instructor at a U.S. Army. Wow. And he went back to Korea, married my mom, and then, you know, life happened and they didn't ever go to church. And my mom comes from like generations of like atheists. They don't, they don't even believe in Buddha or nothing. Mm. Just mm. believe in yourself, <laughs> you know? Yeah, wow. So very strong, you know, willed family background. Um, but somehow God always placed somebody in my life that would invite me to church. So my grandmother was a believer from my dad's side. So she would always stuff like Bible verses in my pocket and I would come home and like pull out papers like candies. This is grandma? Yeah. Shout out grandma. Yeah, <laughs> totally. One of the grandmas, right? So yeah, so yeah I grew up with a whole bunch of Bible verses that she would always give me. And then even after I moved many, many times, there's always somebody that God would place in my life that would invite me to church. So my, I was born in Korea, moved to uh, Northern Virginia uh, when I was in fourth grade. And, but a little time after my dad um, had cancer. Mm. So he passed away when I was 17 years old. And my dad who resisted all his years of not going to church and, uh, you know, and practicing his faith um, started to practice his faith on his deathbed. Wow. So he started calling his friends, telling them to go to church and believe in God and so forth. And when I saw his desperate desire and desperate concern for, uh, you know, him to like, you know, witness to his friends, I just told myself, it was just like a split second epiphany. I, I just told myself, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be 40 some years old and start serving the Lord. I want to serve God. And at that time, uh, wow. out of my own ignorance, I thought the ultimate sacrifice, because I grew up in a Korean American church where, where they highly valued sacrifice, you know, the ultimate sacrifice I can do as a human being is to give my life entirely to God's service, which was be a missionary. Uh, we've had many missionaries like who came and visit our church, told their testimony and so forth. Um, but I went into deep depression and heavy depression uh, without knowing that I was in depression uh, because I was more concerned about my mom and her needs. So I went through what was called uh, functional depression, which I start. I still got good grace. I got my work done and got scholarships and so forth, but I was slowly dying inside with suicidal thoughts, um, like night paralysis, um, like paranoia, insomnia, like anxiety, all of that. And through prayer, I had a incredible like deliverance uh, encounter with God. Wow. And ever since God's been always sending me people who are depressed, who has anxiety and just through prayer would bring healing and so forth. Wow. So I think, um, yeah, so from the get go, going to, going to the university, meeting him, I knew that I couldn't be with whomever that didn't have the same heart to be missionary. And, and then for some reason, God started to open up doors for like Spanish language. I ended up going to a governor's school, went to an immersion program, started dreaming in Spanish. Um, later on, oh. it got all like collapsed. And when I came to Mexico, like I couldn't speak. Um, it was like a whole different language what? situation. <laughs> yeah, it's like Spanish, Spain, like uh, Spanish from Spain is what they teach you in Fairfax County, in Virginia not Mexican Spanish, which is a little bit different. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that's one of the reasons. So I was already like, I, I knew I wanted to go into missions growing wow. up. Yeah, and my, my story is a little bit different. Uh, you know, my, I was born in, in, in DC, mm. you know, grew up my life there. And then uh, middle school, my parents are like, like, hey, <clears throat> we feel like the Lord's calling us into go to missions. And basically, it was a revival that my dad was having. My mom was always on fire for God. <clears throat> um, but it was my, so my dad, he was um, a Korean Marine in Vietnam, and he was a POW. And when he was a POW, he said, God, if I get out of here, like, 
I'm going to become a, a missionary. So because he was from a, a Christian family, right? I'll become a missionary if wow. I get rescued. Mm-hmm. So he gets rescued by U.S. Marines, right? To this day, he loves the U.S. Marines. Like if he can spot a U.S. Marine like a mile away, you know, he's, he's like, like, "That's a U.S. Marine," you know. He's like, "Come and <laughs> see me." <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I love you. Yeah, that's exactly. Dope, dope. Um, so he's like, um, so he's having this revival, right? Mm-hmm. And he's like, and we connect. I, there was this movie. It's a really good movie, um, but it's old, called The Mission. Uh, Robert De Niro's in it. I don't know if you ever oh, seen yeah, that. Oh, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I know what that is. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So that movie, right? So it comes out, and then so our, like, fifth cousins or something like that, they come they're on furlough and they're missionaries in in paraguay right and they're ministering to those same indigenous group that's in this movie guarani right? wow. indians right and we're like watching this movie and then my dad's having this experience and they're like and then they say hey we come you know and so my parents you know they were living the normal immigrant like life right and so they um they sold everything and then we moved down Right? Oh, dude, yeah, and it crazy. wasn't like six months later till I like realized I was like, man, I'm on a different continent, bro. Wait, you know? How old are you? I'm, this is like I'm just getting into high school, right? So, uh, but I'm I'm like I I fall in love with the Latin culture. I just like <laughs> love like being you know outside in the United States. Um, it was it was very revelatory for me, right? I was kind of like I felt like I was in a bubble, and now I was kind of seeing the world, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, I come back to the United States for college, college. And that's where, you know, Janice and I meet. But like before, like we were just friends at first, right? But like one of the things that really God caught me for missions was I, I told God, I said, God, I'll do anything but be a missionary. Hmm. And I told him that because, you know, and it was, it's not, it's, it was hard for my parents, right? It was it hard. There's a lot of sacrifice. There's a lot of sacrifice. They like, you know, I came back and I saw all my friends, you know, they conti- like their business, like the family spirit, you know, their businesses grew. My parents sold everything. Right? So I didn't have anything. So their businesses grew and, you know, they're getting nicer cars. They're like living in nicer places and so on and so forth. And so, you know, they're living that dream type of thing. And we just came back with like nothing, like with the with our clothes on our back. Right. And we had to like start from zero again. And so it was rough. Right. And so I was like, I don't I don't want that like for my for my family or for my for my kids. And then um, for my future. Yeah. For my future kids. Right. And so mm-hmm. then but I went to this one missions like conference. Right. This <laughs> Why retreat. Did you go to missions conference? Because everybody else was going. Right. And so it was in Philadelphia. We all drove to Philadelphia. Right. And it's like I actually went to that one. too. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, it was like the last night. And I don't know if you've been to those places where they like they turn off all the lights. Right. They, and then they, they put the, the yeah. keyboards playing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like everybody's like on the ground, like crying and praying. Right. And um, I was like, I, I found like this folding table. And I would say it was I trying to hide from God, right? I, I don't know. I didn't know if the folding table was going to work, but I thought I was like, the folding it's table. So so I was like trying to hide God. from God, right? And you like, you go yeah. under the table. Yeah. And I was like holding on to the legs of the, the table. The legs. Yeah. Right? I was holding on. And I was like, <laughs> and I felt God, he's like talking to me. He's like, Benny, like, do you trust me? And I was like, that's not fair, God. That's not fair. Like, I felt like it was like God was, uh, God was, you know, Aladdin and I was Jasmine, right? He's like, do you remember the scene where like, do you trust me? <laughs> do you trust me? Do you I trust love me? It. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and so I was like, but I knew if I said no, I couldn't say no, right? But I, if I knew, I knew if I said yes, God, I trust you. I Game knew over. what He was gonna ask me to do was to be go to missions, and so I was <laughs> like, okay, yes, God, yes, of course I trust you. And then, of course, my, you know, my life is, you know, in his hands completely. And so, you know, um, like, you know, my, my daughter's here, right? So, you know, she's an amazing, amazing leader and person. And I know that um, the gifts and experience that she's had, you know, in Mexico, growing up in Mexico, it's like, there's no amount of money I could have gotten from a, some type of education system or program that would have made her the incredible leader that she is today, mm. you know? And everybody says it, like everybody that comes to me like, hey, like, you know, your daughter's amazing. And like, cause she's like serving in the youth at the church. Your daughter's amazing. And like, we started coming back to church because our kids wanted to go to youth group because of your daughter. 
Wow. Yeah. You know? And so, like, I'm like, what? And, like, dude, like, there's, that's, that's the experience, right? That was, like, for her to see and what we do and learn from that, like, I'm so proud, right? So there's no, like, like, I don't need, you know, you don't need the things that you ask, you know, want in life, you know, more than anything you want your children and the next generations to be a blessing, yeah. you know? Mm. And so, bro, that's, you know, a little bit of our story, like how we got yeah. to where we're at. And, mm -hmm. and Mexico City was like key for us. Like it's, it's a strategic city for the rest of Latin America, yeah. if you think about it. And also not only in the sense of like politically, but also arts, music, you know, it's film. Booming. It's it's a yeah, it's and booming. it's good to be Koreans there right now because everything's like. Is there K a big Korean community? Out no, there? bro. No. But oh. you know, everybody loves BTS. We were chinitos. <laughs> we hey, were shout chinitos. Out BTS. Oh, shout yeah. out BTS. Yeah. Follow for Koreans all around the world. No, I think yeah. I, actually. Uh, <laughs> shout out like Blackpink. Side. Blackpink. Yeah, shout, yeah. Out Black shout, shout out. Shout out. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's a good time to be Korean, man. Yeah. It is. It is yeah. right now. Being Korean is very cool. No, because we if you are Asian there, you're just chinito, which is like. Chinese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my son used to be like, Mom, I'm Chinese. I said, no, you're Korean. No, I'm Chinese because everybody called me Chinito. And we used to have this conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it was yeah. actually Sai Gangnam style that put oh, yeah, yeah. Korea on the map for That's the right. Mexicans. Shout out, Sai. Shout out, you know? Dude, I have, <laughs> by the way, speaking of which, I do have some, you know, I've been writing songs for Sai. <laughs> oh, for yeah. real? Yeah, yeah. You, we're not that far <laughs> distant from these types of people. Dude. <laughs> Dude, Sai, if you're listening, man, I have some I have some books for you that are gonna it'll be the next Gangnam style. Y'all hear this? Y'all hear this? Um, wow. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode so far. Just to keep it real, it takes time, energy, and resources to produce this pod. If you feel led to, you can support us by donating on Cash App at Good Service Podcast. Any amount, large or small, is truly appreciated. Thank you guys so much. We love y'all. Back to the episode. I mean, you know, <laughs> real quick, uh, I gotta, I gotta uh, give a shout out to your son because that was such a beautiful image you painted of your daughter, and she's mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. uh, but you didn't say anything about him. <laughs> so, I, so I can say, say something about yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Micah, because he grew up in this ambience of like seeing God's miracles and everything. He has great faith. Wow, he has amazing. great faith. And I think, um, yeah, there is a sense of like calm and peace because he has great faith. Uh, I remember mm. the one particular story, like, and we're talking about, you know, just what we're experiencing. We always share with our story, the miracles that we've been experiencing. And, um, and I remember one time, like our block party, the first block party, it was raining everywhere. Um, but right where the block party was held, there's like a big hole and it was not raining. So God wow. holding back the rain is something that's common. And and then, so I remember Micah, he, I was picking him up. I think he was only about like eight years old. I was picking him up one day and then Karis had uh, after school program. So I picked him up first and we had to kind of wait in the car and stuff and to go get, but it was pouring rain, pouring rain. And um, I was like, why don't you pray Micah for God to stop the rain so you won't get wet like walking to the car. And literally it stopped raining. He walked to the car, it started pouring. And then we need to go pick her up, uh, go back to the school. So we were just sitting in the car, hanging out. And then he prayed and then we walked to school dry. And then we picked her up. Uh, and then as we were picking her up, even all of the, the lady who was in charge of like dismissing the students were like, I don't know what just happened. It was so weird. Like kids are walking to school, it stopped raining. And then after that, it started pouring again. So she was a witness to what was happening. So my guy mm. and I had a private conversation. It's like, you know why that happened? He's like, yeah, because I pray. So that kind of stuff would happen. During the pandemic, I'm like, what do you want to do, Micah? I don't want you to just be living the pandemic life. You know, you still need to dream. It's important for you to continue to dream. He said, like, I want to play in a basketball team. It's like, how is that gonna happen? School's canceled, you know? Like, it's just online class. Like, you, there's no basketball, you know, yeah, during the like, pandemic. And what do you call it? Confinamiento. Like, everybody's like quarantine. locked down. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. He said he wants to play basketball. Then he was taking him to, like, local court, like, 
it's outside, just like we were just randomly, just like pick we're just balls. yeah, pick up ball. And then well, shortly after he prayed, uh, uh, like a local club coach saw him and saw his size. He's six two, you know, oh, at wow. sixteen years old. <laughs> okay. well, at that yeah. time, he was fifteen, you know, and and kind of like scouted him to oh. be part of this. Yeah. So he went to a tournament. Uh, just this year, he went to like a national tournament. His team won second place, wow. you know. So just things like that. That's I want to see snow. I can't do that. You got to ask God and he'll, God will make it happen. Yeah, Janice is going to get quoted now. It's going to say, yeah, uh, God holds back the rain. It's common. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question. So um, like this kind of stuff, I mean, Sounds crazy. Like, it literally sounds like that's impossible, right? Like, this stuff just doesn't happen. Um, I, I want to go back to even um, when you were saying that you were, when you were hiding from God, you're underneath this table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you heard God say, do you trust me? Yeah. What does that mean? What, what does that mean that you heard God say that? Yeah, so I, I always say, like, for me, mm -hmm. there's, you know, God speaks through different ways. Like, he <laughs> speaks through visions. He speaks through, like, you know, dreams. Right. But for me, uh, it's like this, like, I don't know when, like, your gut talks to you, you know, and then it's like, oh, rah, 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 right. Just from, it's like very guttural type of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's and something between like an audible voice and like a thought, right. It's like mm -hmm. an internal. It's in between. It's an, internal, and it's louder. Voice. Definitely to me, it's more audible, not in the auditory sense, but it's audible, like as far as a presence is concerned. And it's, uh, unavoidable like you can't you can't right so agreed, um, agreed. and so some people are kind of like oh it's, it's just your thought but you're like well this is not just it first of all it's not coming originating from right. me it was actually going against your thoughts. against my thoughts mm -hmm. right and against mm -hmm. my will and but it's also louder than my thoughts because you know my mm -hmm. thoughts are i can i'm just gonna i'm gonna pick this up but like it is boom right there and Pink but it's in the face you know, so I, I, that's how I, how I would explain it. Mm, yeah, mm. yeah I, I ask that because I feel people have all sorts of different mm -hmm. ways that they feel like they hear God. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you said, you've had an audible experience where you heard mm -hmm. God yeah, audibly. Yeah. And I'm like, I've never had that. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? So I'm always curious to uh, see how people's. Um, and I think the way that the reason why it's because God speaks to you the way that you need to be spoken to, exactly. yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like there's certain things that translate well with one person that won't translate well with the other person. And so for me, like I've, I've felt where, um, and this is, man, it, it's all as of recent, cause I've actually been very weird about all the prophetic, all that stuff. We've had many conversations about <laughs> yeah. this, right? Um, even <laughs> things like healing and, and prophecy and tongues and all, whatever, all this stuff like the, the charismatic spiritual gifts, yeah. all that stuff made me feel very weird. And, um, and even to this day, it's still not like, like there's, I have triggers, yeah. right? There's, there's certain things when I hear people say certain things, like, Ooh, like what do you mean by that? Yeah, like yeah. Uh, that I've never experienced that, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I have experienced like miraculous healing, like my shoulder, mm -hmm. I had a torn rotator cuff that got healed <laughs> like on the beach in yeah. Hawaii by, you know, well, not by, but like my, my friend's 12 year old son just prayed over my shoulder mm -hmm. and then I was yeah. like, whoa, yeah. feels yeah. good, you know? So, um, I, I, and the reason why I want to bring this up is because, uh, you know, I think even for the people that may be listening to this show. Um, probably may have like a little bit of that skepticism, um, yeah, or you know, yeah. different church traumas that things that being definitely. misused and abused and yeah. things like that. So that's why I'm always curious when I when I hear people say yeah. that, like you know, experiencing stuff like that. I'm like, yeah. what do you mean by that? Like, what yeah. was that for you? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. That's a, you know. I mean, God speaks through all of our five senses, so you cannot, um, yeah, you can't include, or you cannot not include. Uh, common sense and wise counsel, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not always like this audible voice and this uh, supernatural, like what we consider supernatural, because for God, there's no boundaries of supernatural, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. natural. I can be eating and he could be speaking to me about something. And I just feel this conviction in my heart. And I think a lot of people, it's, I actually teach all the prophetic stuff and I hold prophetic conferences and things like that. But uh, one of the most frequent questions is like, how do I know if it's my voice or if it's God's voice? How do I distinguish it? Well, it's going to sound like your voice because God 
choose to adapt to our language,、mm. you know. So I mainly deal with like Mexican population. So I say he's probably not gonna speak to you in in Spanish, you know. <laughs> I mean, he's probably not gonna speak to you in Korean,、mm -hmm, you know.、Mm -hmm. But he sometimes speaks to me in Korean, you know, because it has some weight to me, and he uses your language. So if he were to speak to a youth person, you know, or consider hip. They may say, God may say, "Hey, bro, you know, like my daughter bros us all the time. <laughs> Even one of her friends, like I had. I don't a, know if God is saying, 'Hey, bro.' <laughs> it probably wouldn't. He probably wouldn't say that to me,、mm -hmm. but he does. You know, he does. There's a Spanish Mexican term,、um, neta. Neta is like really,、uh, you know, for real type、mm -hmm, of thing.、Mm -hmm. And it's like it's like、More、a slang, you know? it's a、mm -hmm. current slang term, you know, because when we first came to Mexico, it wasn't there,、mm -hmm. you know. They're always inventing new slangs, and <laughs> I I asked、uh, this young girl, close your eyes, and ask God to speak to you, and she was like, "Neta, te amo cañón," like it's all slangy, you、mm -hmm. know. And I was like, "Wow, God totally does speak her language,、mm. you know, an 18 year old girl who."、Mm. Because he want him to be comprehensible, so the fact that he is incomprehensible, this infinite, you know, wisdom, you know, alpha and omega, like beginning to end, but he wants to make himself comprehensible to us. So he's going to use what's in our hand. He's going to utilize who we are, our own voice, our vocab to be able to speak to us. And you can sometimes it's gonna feel like. Fifty-one percent your voice, forty-nine percent his voice, but you'll know it by the fruit, you know, because his voice should be producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which、mm -hmm. is kindness, gentleness, love, and all of that. So if it's kind of like pulling people away from God and or leaving people in condemnation, even though what the voice is saying is true about your circumstances, it's not voice of God, you know. So you sometimes only will know it by by the fruit, and I think that's that's why it does take risk. But if you are like with a safe group of people, you can actually practice like hearing God. You can practice hearing God. It's about frequency of the radio. I mean, the radio is always on. We we're the one that's turning it off, turning it on,、mm -hmm. and adjusting the frequency. You just have to get in the frequency of God. You know. Yeah. So like、mm. one of the stories like for about hearing God's voice. So、um, we had a girl that was brought to us.、Um, she was 15 years old when she came to us. She was trafficked from Oaxaca to Mexico City. She thought she was, you know, going to get a job, like you know, working at this. <clears throat> I think she was going to do like housekeeping or something like that. And when she gets to the city, the women that brought her sold her、mm -hmm. to two men. They stripped her naked. They chained her to the floor. They started beating her, like physically beating her, and then. Being her or having you know men come in per twenty to thirty times a day, okay, and they'll get paid. And every day, this was happening. Like she was getting beat twenty, thirty times a day. And then after about three, four months of this, then they put her out on the street to like stand there, like in like in prostitution, right in the red light district. And so she didn't run. You know, she was broken. By that point in time, she's like, you know, think about like the amount of that trauma and abuse and just psychological, just like oppression, right? So, and you know, of course, the threats to her family and so on and so forth, right? So she had no will to live at that point in time. So she's there, and someone noticed her. She looks a little too young. Yeah, they report it. They report it. They come in, and then they they rescue her. So. She comes in, and then within a couple of days, like she's at our safe house, she's like, you know, she starts complaining. She can't hear, right? She's talking really loud. She can't hear. So、um, we take her to the doctors, right, and to get a hearing test done. And because of the physical abuse, they were saying that she had lost a hundred percent hearing in one ear and fifty percent in the other. So we got her like a hearing aid for the good ear, right?、Um, so a couple months down the road, she. You know, on Friday we had this Bible study at the at the safe house, and we, you know, talk about the voice of God. And so she raised her hand. And she was like, "Can you pray for me? Because I want to hear God's voice, right?" So that was Friday, Saturday morning when the girls get to sleep in, right? 
the other girls had gotten up earlier and they were making noise in the patio. And so she was trying to sleep in more. So she gets upset. She runs out and tries to get everybody to be quiet because she wants to sleep more. But then she realizes she doesn't have her hearing aid in. Right, so she's like, I, I can hear, I can hear. So she was <laughs> like, hey, just whisper in my ear, whisper in my ear. I can hear you. I can hear you. And so we're like, no, it can't be. You know, we're not we're, th- we're not b- believing that this is happening. Right. So we take her to the same doctor like on Monday who gave the hearing, who gave the hearing aid, the prescription, everything. Right. So um, I don't know if you ever got a hearing test done, but it's like you're done five, ten minutes. It's super fast. Right. So we were there for over two hours because she, like, they couldn't believe the results that were coming. They thought the machine was broken. Whoa. So they went back and got another machine. She had deafness in one year and then only 50% in the other, other, the original Mm. test. Came back 100% hearing in both ears. In both ears. In both ears. Oh my gosh, that's wild. Now the wild thing is, my friend who's a doctor, uh, he's at UCI Medical Center now, but he was at USC at the time. And he was doing medical missions with us, and he was like, "Hey, uh, I want. I heard the story. I want to look at her ear, right?" So he like takes that thing. I don't know what it's called, but that scope thing. And he like she's mm-hmm. looking. He's looking at her ear, and he just keeps on shaking his head. And I'm like, "Well, what's going on, Andrew?" And he's like, uh, "No, man, I, I don't know what to tell you, but uh, she I'm, can't he be like, hearing." Yeah, I'm disappointed to tell you, but she can't hear. And I'm like, "What do you mean?" He's like, the damage, the physical damage is there. And it's to the point where it's like, irrepar- like, you know, like mm-hmm. the eardrum still busted. Yeah, yeah. busted. So she hears to this very day, supupernaturally. What? She, there wasn't, <laughs> there is no, there is no like Whoa. natural, it wasn't reconstructive Whoa, healing. Wow. But, it was just supernatural. <laughs> but get this, she, Never asked for the healing. Right. She said, I want to hear God's voice. She wanted to connect with God. She was right. seeking the healer. Not the mm. healing. It was Seek just a- the healer, not the healing. Mm. Whoa. Seek the provider, not the provision. Mm. Come That's on. That's so good, you know? man. That's so good. That's, That's crazy. crazy. I'm wow. like, I'm just like, imagine, I'm like, how? This is, that's nuts, dude. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Um, so, I mean, okay, with what you guys are doing, I mean, um, what what is the like the practical way for somebody who uh, wants to be involved with the work mm-hmm. somehow? I mean, not everybody can go to Mexico and be a missionary mm-hmm. and, and do that full time. So for anybody out there who may want to help mm-hmm. or, or, yeah, some practical things, like what are some things that... Um, that maybe you guys need or things Mm -hmm. that people can just do for themselves to be involved? Yeah. I mean, we love doing things relationally. And I know that sometimes um, people have this idea of coming and serving. That's great. Um, But I do feel like we're in this sort of, um, this niche of like promoting uh, integral health and, um, you know, holistic healing and so forth. So I always say bring... Uh, gather people and come down and visit catch the vision of what we're doing you know let uh, let the work in itself like speak to you Mm. you know so that's one thing and then just if you have come visited if you uh if you have come and connected then you can help in different ways you can uh, raise awareness in your small groups or just a group of friends um, you can, you know, rate, uh, do prayer events, uh, prayer intercession uh, nights. We also have monthly prayer meeting every first Monday of the month via Zoom. You can get connected and participate in that. Uh, you can raise funds, you can do events, or you can even do events to raise awareness of this issue and be um, an informed purchaser of like where your clothes are coming from in all of the process of where the sourcing is happening, you know, and is the clothes um, participating in any form, any way, a human trafficking or even labor trafficking where children are not being paid, um, you know, um, a dignified salary or they're using forced child labor and so forth. So um, be educated about where you're purchasing things, um, do ethical purchasing things like that. So there's just so many ways uh, to get connected. 
Uh, we often get invited, not just us, but we have a wonderful team. We're about um, 50 people staff, um, including some of the missionaries who are with us. So any one of us can host um, a Zoom you know, session with your group of friends or a group that you gather. You know, at the end, um, our, our story is important to us, but you know, people who don't know who we are, so they're probably gonna be connected to your story or people who you know, have a story that is living here. So that's why it's important for them to actually come and connect with the story. And as you tell your story of what you learned and what was impacted in your life through the visit, that's when you can influence and impact, mm -hmm. really. Because our story is not that important to them, yeah. you know. And, mm -hmm. and our tagline is freedom for all, which means, you know, we're all connected. You know, we, we talked about it on the call before, like we are all connected. I, I believe in the ecosystem of things mm -hmm. like and how the freedom that you like work for and fight for and the freedom that you're working for, like you're that you're helping your brother or your cousin out or your your, your you know your friends mm -hmm. your family helping for their freedom is working to fight for freedom yeah. globally mm -hmm. you know because building he healthy family healthy relationship prevents human trafficking yeah. because a lot of these girls have been vulnerable to human trafficking because there was already damage that happened in the family background you know so i think you know even the most simple thing it's like you know you don't have to always come down or do do that i mean work towards your own freedom fight for that freedom, you know, and then become a healthy, strong person so you can help somebody else. As you start helping other people, that be, it just continues, you know. Yeah. And I, we're all we're about the long game, you know. We're not about trying to like get things done like tomorrow. If if it could get done tomorrow, I'd be I mean, but I'm we would I'm, have gotten it done. Yeah, but it's like <laughs> it's about the process and we love the process. I mean, we I, you know, you have to kind of embrace patience. Like that's not something that yeah. like most people in the world they want to embrace, but there's some there's beauty in the process. There's beauty in embracing the patience and the timing of God. So, so many of us are so eager to get things done fast, but everything that gets built fast mm -hmm. breaks fast, mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. And I don't want that. I want something that'll last mm -hmm. and last throughout the generations. I mean, it might be because our age too. We're almost fifty, yeah. so we're thinking about not just how to live our life, but thinking about the next generation mm -hmm. you know leaving yeah. a legacy and what is it that i want to cultivate what is it is that i want to carve out you know uh, of maybe a path that the next generation can walk through and i do believe that our gen we're gen x our generation is like a bridge maker we understand the discipline and we understand like the rigidity of the you know previous generation and we understand the freedom and the authenticity, authenticity like all of the young generation want, you know. And I do believe that we uh, we grew up with enough structure that we're able to provide that to be able to, you know, build something that'll last. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, for the uh, website, um, you guys have a website. Is, is there a place where people can like financially support and things like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, um, el pozo de vida .mx. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can get and there follow us on on instagram, instagram at pozo de vida oh, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll, we'll without the el yeah mm -hmm. um so good service is the name of the pod um mm -hmm. so we we love to hear um everybody's definition of what that is like what is mm -hmm. good what is service what is a good service that you provide to the world that you guys run in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i love i actually love that name um because you know, a lot of people want perfection and there isn't. God created the world and he said it was good. You know, he never said perfect. Amen. And he created us and he said, well, very good. So I believe it's returning, restoring the original design, you know? And mm. I, I believe that uh, with the work that we are doing, we're storing the original design of each person and the dignity of each person and restoring opportunity for they can, where they can live out their freedom. So I, I believe that good for me is restoring the abundance and the original design. You know, when I think about service, I think about like, okay, it's not like when you're 
it's not about sacrificing yourself to the point where you're I, I think that's really kind of not not the healthiest way of doing things you mm -hmm. kind of end up your 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 fuse gets really short then and you don't really have any longevity uh so when i think about service i just kind of feel like okay how am i really honestly connecting with the other person you know because i'm i want them to to understand why i do what i do and um and they receive it well so if i'm not connecting with that person which then i'm not really offering them any type of service it's just kind of like me just trying to push something down yeah, imposing their throat, imposing mm -hmm. upon so yeah I, I relevancy think, yeah relevancy and then mm -hmm. the um i also think about like okay my mentor uh, jim gustason in, in in thailand has always said like like the gospel is not like uh you know top a down. top down where it's like very like but it's comes down low and lifts up so how do i lift up other people and that's what service looks like to me yeah so that would be mm -hmm. good service so then we have to put the two together is that the whole thing <laughs> no that's it oh, that's great oh, that's that was great. Good. you guys did a great job oh okay yeah, yeah. um I mean, Dad, yeah, thank you for coming on and sharing the story. I think this is something, uh, I think probably this is the least Kevin and I have talked because I think we're just like in yeah, listening. Yeah, we're really engrossed by this. Like, everything yeah. was like so much. I'm like, I want to hear so much more. There's going to be a part two, three, four. And five. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll learn more tonight. When, we're talking. Uh, Oh, no, man. no, yeah. I, lo I love it. I love it. You guys. You guys can... No, but uh, no, we're just we're just listening because I mean I'm I'm here learning. Uh, but no, thank you for the work that you guys are doing. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for just being sensitive to the call that God's put on your heart and mm -hmm. um, yeah. and for sharing even just yeah just the even the way that you guys hear God. I think that's something uh, that we need to talk about more. Uh, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think everybody's always wondering like how do i know the the call of god right and mm -hmm. and uh so thank you for for sharing that but um can i can i i want to tag on and i know i don't want to get nerd nerdy out like this but I love like it. Um, go for it uh and i've been reflecting upon this a lot during this week and i heard nt Wright. nt Wright's this phenomenal new testament scholar like he's british and when he talks it sounds really deep so it's not going to sound as deep as like as if he was gonna say it but you know um, he was talking about the absolutism of God, right? And then, like, we have, um, like, okay, we we see, like, oh, in the Greek mindset, and you know, it's God is omnipotent, omniscient, and um, omnipresent, right? Are you guys, if you were mm -hmm. in, grew up in the church, right, you heard that He's the three omnis and all that type of stuff, right? And it just creates this like ultimate like god that's like so out there and so all powerful and all knowing and everything like that so that creates a problem because people are like well if he's all knowing then you know and all powerful then how can he allow evil and so on and so forth right so if you posit god as that and just that then you run into a lot of problems so my point in me adding this is like about hearing God, right? Is in the Hebrew mindset, in the Jewish mindset, God's a lot more dialogical. He's more engaged in, in a dialogue. Mm -hmm. If you look throughout the Old Testament, he's engaged in a dialogue with his people, right? Yeah. And so he's not coming around saying, oh, I'm the omnipresent, omnipotent God, you know? He just says, I am, right? So and that creates a lot of space for dialogue like mm. you are what mm -hmm. you know and how are you the way that you are and it becomes a lot more relational mm. it's 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 a relational thing and so when we talk about hearing god we're not just hearing an omnipotent omniscient you know distant god, distant god mm. but a god that wants to be in a dialogue with us mm. you know mm. and um, once we understand that and not put God in this like Wizard of Oz type of like, you know, behind the curtain type of thing, um, it starts like the world starts opening up for you. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. I, I was actually reminded today, actually, um, 
like I have I have these questions like I'm supposed to be going to Korea in a week and I don't have a plane ticket. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like, am I actually going? And um, I was I was sharing this with somebody and um, she encouraged me like, ask God. <laughs> like God yeah. wants you to ask him whether you're going or not. I'm like, yeah. you know, it's so it's so funny because I think I can get caught up in this like, oh, I, I can only talk to God about, you know, big things or things that um, are for his glory and kingdom and or I need help with this, but not like on the day to day stuff like, God, do you want me to go to Korea or not? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like like simple things where, you know, I, I'm not I'm not a father, but, you know, Kevin's a father. I'm sure you love it when your boys just ask you questions. Yeah. Right. You're never annoyed with your kids questions. No, I love it. And so I would imagine <laughs> that if if we as humans can just enjoy the mm-hmm. the dialogue between children, you know, your children, like how much more does our perfect father in heaven love every single mm-hmm. thing that we ask him and talk to him about mm-hmm. and nothing's going to bore him, nothing's mm-hmm. going to disappoint him you know he already know i mean yeah speaking of omniscient he already knows Mm -hmm. what we're thinking and feeling and he wants you to come to him with that Mm -hmm. and so i think even with that just um yeah something so simple like ask god about it you know have a conversation with him about it and like he delights in that Mm -hmm. and so i think there's so much um yeah in terms of looking at god as a relational god um, it just changes perspective. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I think it's very easy to think that God is right. distant and he only cares about grand things. Like, no, he cares about the little minute details of just how you're feeling today, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think that's really good. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, but yes, thank you folks for tuning in to another episode of Good Service. We will be plugging all of El Poso's stuff in the show description, in the caption. Uh, make sure you support them. And thank you for listening or watching. Make sure you like, follow, subscribe. Follow us on socials at Good Service Pod. And I think that's it. We out. We out of here. Good service. Peace. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode. Make sure you like, follow, and subscribe and leave us that five-star rating. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Good Service Pod and on YouTube at Good Service Podcast. And if you'd like to support us, you can donate on Cash App at Good Service Podcast. Thank you. Peace.